are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made um, on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I'd uh, like to welcome you all here today uh, to hear uh, a talk from uh, one of our visiting scholars this year, Natella Rakoshna. Uh, won't do a long bio because we're all interested to hear uh, the talk today. I will say that most recently uh, she's a graduate from a PhD program from VN, I want to get this right, Karazan Kharkiv National University, uh, the Faculty of Law uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the title of the dissertation was Mediation uh, in the Concept of Restorative Justice. And she brings uh, with her here an expertise in mediation, ADR, human rights, family mediation, business mediation, corporate mediation, restorative justice more generally, and international arbitration. Uh, she's been here since uh, July, since June 1st. June. June 1st, which is hard to, seems like yesterday, but it's actually a cafe <laughs> year almost. Having fun. Uh, and uh, we're excited to have this opportunity to, to hear from her for the first time publicly. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Natella. Thank you very much for introducing me, and let's start. So. Today we're going to talk, going to talk about uh, dimensions of mediations uh, and uh, perhaps you already know that there are several ways uh, of uh, uh, several alternative ways to resolve conflicts and the most famous of them mediation, arbitration and of course negotiation. So ADR means uh, solving disputes outside the court. And I want to talk about the word alternative. Because as for me, the word alternative excludes collaboration between this, uh, with, uh, this ways of resolving conflict and adds some traits of competition. Because uh, the word alternative doesn't give us an opportunity to perceive mediation as a self-sufficient way to resolve conflict. Because we always have a question, alternative to what? To judicial system and uh, why we call it alternative dispute resolution like alternative milk or alternative meat it's not real meat right <laughs> like, uh, it's alternative fake I don't have anything against alternative meat uh, it's, it's good but uh, it's alternative and alternative dispute resolution is it really dispute resolution and if we have a conflict and we can't resolve it by ourselves, we need to choose between traditional way to resolve conflicts, which, uh, which means go to the court, or choose alternative ways to resolve it. And this is the competition between alternative ways to resolve conflicts and judicial system. And I thought, why? Uh, despite so many benefits of mediation, a lot of people still hesitate and doubt about choosing this way to resolve conflicts. And I concluded that our brain has been wired for it. And court system is recognized by everybody like given us something given us from above. And our understanding of the law is the same. It's a huge mechanism of making justice with a lot of power and ability to force you to do something even if you don't want to do so and on the one hand it is scary that this mechanism will resolve dispute not in your favor but on the other hand it is recognized by everybody it's something that we know from our childhood and we never doubt about how useful this system is so we give to this machine almost sacred value and believe in it, despite all disadvantages. What we have on the other side of the scale? Powerless mediator who can't evaluate or suggest something but promise. This is the good way to resolve conflict. And in our mind, it's the end of competition. But I don't want to put dot. We'll digress a little from our main subject, but it's necessary for explaining my point of view. 
Since the judiciary is a branch of state power, I want to quickly remind you some basic theories of origin of the state. As humans who were born in established social order, we rarely think about how this system was established and who did it. But some people were thinking about it a lot. And there are a lot of theories of origin of the state. And those theory that I want to review the di uh, Diamond theory. This theory is of the view that the state is divinely ordained as such demand absolute obedience from all within it confines. In other words, under this theory, individuals have no right to assert any rights because they have none, or to revolt uh, against government because it's ordained by God. The social contract theory. This theory is of the view that at point in time, men freely agree to bind themselves together under a government and each person is duty bound to keep the, to the terms of the agreement. The agreement was two-sided. It was binding to, uh, on both authority and the subjects and sovereign powers were limited to the terms of the agreement. In other words, it was agreed that as long as sovereign kept his own side of the agreement, as long as he protects lives and property and freedom, of subjects, the subject would remain loyal to his authority. The next theory is organic theory. According to this theory, society is a living organism and the state is a part of this organism, its brain, which performs clearly defined functions. And next theory, evolutionary theory or historical theory. According to this theory, the state is a historical growth and result of a gradual evolution. It is continuous development, can you be referred to any single moment of time, circumstance or any event, etc. And there are many theories of origin of the state that we need to stop. And this theory is for an example, as an impetus to ask question to ourselves. Why do we believe in the state and law? Or what is the state and law? Where are the, uh, where are the rules of this system? And why do we trust the system? I can assume that most of us uh, think something like the judiciary is a branch of state power, the state system is based on the law, and the law is universal recognized system of rules. But what if we will think further? Let's talk about law and legal norms. It's important because we are thinking about making justice in the courtroom and we are thinking about applying the law to certain situations, right? So, I was taught that legal rule is a universally binding, formally defined rule of conduct guaranteed by the state reflecting the level of freedom of citizens and organizations acting as a regulator of social norms. And it reminds me of the categorical imperative of Kant. He was talking about moral and law, and he concludes that moral proposition, that is true, must be one that is not tied to any particular conditions, including the identity and desires of person making the moral deliberation. A moral maxim must be absolute necessity, which is to say that it must be disconnected from the particular physical details surrounding the proposition and could be applied to any rational being. The ideas to the first formulation of the categorical imperative sometimes called principle of universalizability means act only according to that maxim where we can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So act only according to that maxim, where you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. George Simmel, German philosopher, argues that Kant in the idea of a universal law loses sight of very essence of the moral requirement, which can only be individual, since life manifests itself only in the form of individuality. 
which is the only and only source of both the real and the proper. And from these philosophical deliberations, we can make conclusions that is very debatable what genuine justice is and what law should we have, which casts doubts on the exclusivity and fairness of the norms of the law as universal rules of conduct that we must apply in appropriate situations. And eventually it's produced by us, by our understanding of what is fair. It all leads to our customs, morals, our general understanding of what is good and what is bad. And what is good and what is bad is always debatable. That is why we have lawyers, judges, law faculties to learn this art. Art of understanding and applying the law. Now that we understand how ambiguous justice is in general and how controversial its implementation at the law and how ambiguous the structure of the judicial system as a universal tool for administering justice, we can take a closer look at other ways of resolving conflicts. And I want to ask questions. I want you to ask questions to ourselves, like what mediation is? And if we don't have a perfect system of making justice, mostly because it's impossible, of course. If we, don't, if we know how many disadvantages court system has, if this system is not sacred and reflect our genuine human's understanding of law and justice, what is the place of mediation in the legal conflicts resolution? In my understanding, mediation is full-fledged tool for the administration of justice based on the voluntary consent of law-conscious individuals to accept responsibility for resolving conflicts that has affected them. Mediation is not alternative to something. Mediation is addition to justice, to justice tools. And it was introduction, and now we can go to the main part of the lecture and as you might expect we'll start with brief of the view of how ADR came into being. Uh, due to the fact that the phrase alternative dispute resolution is generally accepted and known, I will use it in my lecture despite uh, uh, the fact that this phrase limits our perception. So there are several reasons why ADR movement has begun. And all those reasons pointed out on dissatisfaction of judicial system. For the first time, serious dissatisfaction with the judicial system and the work of the courts as such sounded in 1906 at the annual convention of the American Bar Association. It was young professor Roscoe Pound, and his address was entitled The Causes of Popular Dissatisfaction with the Administration of Justice. His 1906 ABA address launched 18 separate critics at the American system of civil justice, and he broke this down into four primary categories. First one, causes for the dissatisfaction with all legal system. Second, causes for dissatisfaction with the peculiarities of Anglo-American legal system specifically. Causes for dissatisfaction with American judicial organization and procedure. And causes for dissatisfaction with the environment of uh, American judicial administration. He asserted that the court system had become archaic and our procedure behind the time, and it was in 1906. The results are uncertainty, delay and expense, and above all, the injustice of deciding cases upon points of practice. For that time, his speech was very scandalous. And as a response to it, one man declared that American justice system is far from being archaic, is the most refined and scientific system ever devised by wit of man and that Pound's attacks were too unconscionable to discuss. 
For that time, his criticism of current system was very bold, and as you can understand, many of those who were presented uh, were offended by his speech. And it took over 70 years to embrace and consider his criticism. And then, the second conference in 1976, organized by Warren Burger and named Bound Conference, established a real idea movement for making something to change current system. Frank Sander suggested at, that, uh, at this conference multi-door courthouse system, which should exist parallelly to the legislation system and resolve that kind of disputes that could be resolved by facilitation, mediation, and arbitration without additional burden on the judiciary and providing more easier access for resolving conflicts. That idea has been embodied and alternative dispute resolution system started its work for helping justice system overcome their problems. So these historical conferences marked the beginning of the, of the development and spread a year around the world. And even now, there are a lot of countries which have almost the same problems with access to judiciary system. It is expensive. It takes a lot of time. It's difficult to impact on a result that's why we have unpredictable result. It is stressful and we have binding decision that we have to exercise even if we are not satisfied with it. And with this, uh, with this situation, eight years seems the easiest way to overcome some problems. And now we will try to figure out why, using the example of mediation process. And when we heard, uh, when we heard about mediation first time, how it was, our imagination drawn the picture where couple persons with some slight differences small conflicts decide to come to the mediator to talk about it and get the answer. Very easy. In this context, mediation seems like an absolutely useless procedure. What the reason to go to the mediator if it's slight difference and probably you can resolve it by negotiations? On the other side, serious conflicts, it's not for mediation. So there are several myths about mediation. First one, mediation is for people who came across as a simple conflict or mediation is for people who could talk with each other. Mediation is something uh, about talking with mediator like with a psychologist. Mediation is meditation. Court is more effective in resolving disputes. And without words, you can't reach a fair agreement, so it's wasting of time. Today we will try to break some of them and figure out what is the truth. And I want to explain what mediation is, and I will start with explaining the main principles of mediation, and the role of mediator, and maybe it will give us some answers why mediation is a type of procedure, and I'm pretty sure it will. So. The mediator role uh, in the process of mediation is assisting disputants and help them to go through the process. And this isolates triangle here for a reason, and you need to imagine this triangle in horizontal surface, not the vertical one. So I use it for exemplifying equal rights during the mediation and equal distance between mediator and parties. Mediator should always be equally supportive and empathetic to both sides of disputes. It will help to exercise his or her ob obligations as a mediator more successfully. Notwithstanding, mediator organize this procedure and assist disputants to go through this process. He or she doesn't have additional power to be higher than parties of the conflict. That's why you need to perceive it like a horizontal surface. It's not higher than parties. So mediator should not impose to the parties of the conflict his own view uh, of how to resolve the situation. 
mediators neither give advice nor his own assessment of situation. Mediator is neutral and it is on the same level as the parties of the conflict. And it's forbidden for mediator to blame and condemn parties of the conflict or their decision or their, or their views. During the mediation process, the mediator doesn't show his uh, own opinion about the situation and no matter how much he wants. Every mediator's action should exemplify neutrality and equal attitude. Mediator is not attorney, prosecutor or judge. Mediator is mediator. And it is uh, mediator seeks also to show his empathy and support to both sides of the conflict equally. It is important to create safe atmosphere and ensure people involved in the process reveal their concerns and worries, sometimes hopes and fears, and it is possible exclusively in the well-controlled situations where you can count on somebody's support. But this support shouldn't turn out into sympathy uh, on the, to the one uh, of the parts of the conflict. It is absolutely natural that people could feel sympathy for the one side of the conflict and then have good attitude to another side of the conflict, but for mediator it's forbidden. Mediator should be able to control his own emotions. And this is the hardest thing that you can do during the mediation. You should control yourself. You should control the process. You should be able to express support and empathy and moderate other steps. Also, mediator should control the power balance in the process and shouldn't allow one party uh, use pressure to another party. Agreement should be mutually acceptable and reflect, and reflect the real needs and interests of the both parties. And making parties understand their real needs and interests uh, is a mediator objective too. So, mediator should be able to assist the conflict's resolution process, facilitate communication between the parties and ensure that the decision meets their uh, interests and needs and is realistic to implement. And I think like, I need to be clear that there are several types of mediation and there is, like, for example, evaluative mediation where a mediator can evaluate the situation and give some legal advices to the parties, but we are considering well-balanced mediation, and I think it's the most uh, widespread type of mediation. So let's move on. Confidentiality. One of the principles underlying the mediation process is confidentiality. Like it has already been mentioned, safe and informal atmosphere allows to achieve the effect when the parties feel free to express their feelings. And since mediator can't force uh, parties to do something that they don't want to do or talk about something that they don't want to talk, it is very important to create this atmosphere. Might you know that it's not very easy to reveal some things because in this moment you can feel yourself vulnerable and fragile and confidentiality allows you to talk about something that you will not talk in other situation. And for example, for people who are worrying about their reputation, it is also a big advantage to keep privacy that is why this principle of confidentiality should always associate with mediation. Confidentiality means safety. Confidentiality means that no one can reveal any details from the mediation process other than, the, uh, other than those agreed by the parties. And that is why on mediation people can talk about all things that related to the disputes and don't worry about their reputation. The details of their relationship, personal life, business, finances and other things will not be made public. 
Next principle is principle is process flexibility. So uh, this principle could have three meanings. First one, the process is informal and parties of the disputes could make their schedule of mediation meetings appropriate to them, which is convenient, especially compared to the legislative process. The second meaning is about to slide between process steps of mediation if it's needed, and absence of rigid frameworks and commitments regarding the process. Especially for resolving very important questions in people's lives, when the situation is stressful as such, it is good that mediation can provide a safe, less nervous atmosphere and let you talk about things that really matter without rigid borders and without questions about appropriateness if it's related to the, to the dispute. The third meaning of the principle is that mediation has the opportunity to organize mediation to the people who don't want to be at the same place at the same time and don't want to talk with each other. It is possible to reach an agreement without facing with the other side and it calls uh, shuttle mediation. So mediator is shuttling between parties to make the conversation and discussions possible and sometimes it is the only one opportunity to reach an agreement. Next principle is voluntary participation. As we already talked, mediator cannot curse parties to do something. That is why disputants should have their own desire to resolve conflict. Otherwise, it will be unreasonable spending time without any result. It also means that involved disputants could leave the mediation process without any uh, obligations and consequences if they want to leave it. The principle of voluntariness is also the big part of discuss among scientists. Somebody of them, some of them think that mediation should be absolutely voluntary and law can't prescribe obligation to take part in this process. Some of them think that this prom will promote uh, mediation and increase the rate of participation of medi in mediation. And both approaches has, have their pros and cons, but anyway, even if participation in mediation can be prescribed. Nobody can force disputants to reach an agreement or curse further participation if they don't want to do it, whether the reason is. All these principles exemplify how free and disputants-oriented mediation is. But we still don't understand how we, like, what we will experience going through the mediation process. The question is how it will be. And we miss the really important characteristic of mediation. Mediation is structured. There are few different stages of mediation that lead disputants to mutually acceptable agreement. And it is mediator's objective to assist parties going through these stages. Good, mediation, good mediator always know where the parties are, means in the mediation process. And all these stages are substantially important to have and they have a huge impact on the future agreement. Sometimes peop, uh, parties can't reach an agreement just because they didn't complete some stages. Well, and it has become difficult for them to understand themselves and their counterpart. And that is why mediators should be well prepared to mediation and understand this procedure. He or she has a big part of responsibility of the result of the process. And just to be clear, I want to add that the other part of the responsibility is on the parties. And before mediation will be started, mediator should explain that parties of the dispute are playing the big role in mediation process. So mediation is supposed that parties of the conflict will take an active participation in resolving the situation. And it means 
that they were able to impact on the final agreement, which is good. And nobody knows their situation better than they know. Nobody understands their feelings better than they understand them. And nobody can resolve this situation, their situation better than they can. So, that is why mediation provides a huge space for parties of the conflict for making the best suitable for them agreement that will satisfy both parties. So, I think you might be interested what stages mediation has. Uh, I will warn you in advance that there are a lot of approaches to determine the stages uh, of mediation process, but procedure almost always the same. So the first stage is the mediation stage. Uh, in the, at this stage, mediator will uh, meet first time with disputants, uh, will talk with them and make decision will he or she participate in this uh, conflict resolution process or not. Next stage is opening mediation process stage. It's very formal stage. Next one is boarding subject of differences, and then uh, they, and then uh, on next stage, uh, parties and mediator they should explore every subject of uh, their differences that they determined uh, in previous stage. The next stage is brainstorming for uh, developing solution. Next stage, bargaining stage to choose the most appropriate solution. Uh, next one, reaching final agreement and closure. So I basically didn't use numbering of these points uh, because we always can back to the previous stage uh, if needed, but you can see the general sequence. Uh, anyway, and of course, the mediator must control this process and vector of the further movement. For parties, these stages are not visible and it's not their competence. Uh, I don't want to explain like um, every uh, stage in the process because we don't have a lot of time, uh, but I think uh, we have understanding of uh, how uh, what structure mediation has. And let's talk about purpose of mediation. Is mediation aimed at reaching an agreement? I could say yes and no. I will explain. As you already understood, mediation is a process which exists as it's such. It is holistic, logically built and self-sufficient. Will mediation process be mediation without reaching an agreement? Yes. Because sometimes people can't reach an agreement even in, in the mediation process. Mediation is a very effective procedure with a lot of benefits, uh, but there isn't any magic, and sometimes mediation could be unsuccessful for somebody. And even though it could be helpful and it could have good effect, which lies in the fact, it, which, it, which lies in the fact that mediation uh, participants understand their true interests and needs the situation as a whole and they uh, could more consciously take further steps to resolve their conflict. But on the other hand, reaching an agreement is the vector of the whole process. I would like to use the word vector instead of goal or aim, but anyway it is moving toward that side. And it is something that participants expect to get at the end of mediation. But for mediator, the main focus is on the process, and the main value is in the creating environment where sides of the conflict could understand their self and each other. And as a consequence, all these things lead to the agreement in the most cases. So now we came to the part of little law review. Uh, we can compare several definitions of mediation and I decided to choose the Canadian Bar Association definition because Canada doesn't have federal mediation law and for all provinces and I decided that these definitions would be suitable for my purpose. So, Canadian Bar Association definition. 
defined by Chris Moore in 1986. Defines, uh, he defines mediation as the intervention into a dispute or negotiation by an acceptable, impartial and neutral third party who has no decision-making power to assist disputants, uh, disputing parties in voluntary reaching their own mutually acceptable settlement or issues in dispute. Federal Republic of Germany, Mediation Act 2012. Mediation is a confidential and structured process in which the parties strive on a voluntary basis and autonomously to achieve an amicable solution of their conflict with the assistance of one or more mediators. Ukrainian Mediation Law 2021 Mediation is an out-of-court, voluntary, confidential, structured procedure during which the parties, with the help of a mediator, try to prevent the occurrence or settle a conflict dispute through negotiations. <coughs> As you can see, Ukrainian and German definitions are pretty similar compared to Canadian Bar Association definition. Also, I want to indicate on date of each definition. You can see the distance between the definitions not just because of different approaches, but also because of developing mediation and understanding of this process. German and Ukrainian definitions don't pay a lot of attention to mediator's role, but provide more detailed information about the process. The definition of Canadian Bar Association doesn't indicate structural nature of the mediation and doesn't mention about confidentiality, but instead of this, gives a lot for understanding of the mediator's position in the process. And another important moment you should notice, the Canadian and German definitions point out on the parties' autonomy in the process, which gives more understanding about their role in resolving the disputes. All three concepts contain the principle of voluntariness, which is commendable, but as you see, no one definition is perfect. That's why I don't want to start. I didn't want to start with reading definitions to understand what mediation is. But determination of the mediation is kind of indicator, which shows us how law regulates this process and what the level of authorities understanding of this process. The definitions of the process is very substantial part of mediation regulation and I believe that it should be enshrined in law. Canada, according to the federal structure, doesn't have unified mediation law and leave the space for province initiative and some provinces have the law which regulates some aspects of mediation process and moreover ensuring mandatory mediation in certain cases. For example, Ontario Mandatory Mediation Program has rules of civil procedure which stipulate mandatory mediation in specified actions in order to reduce cost and delay in litigation and facilitate the early and fair resolution of disputes. Manitoba province doesn't have strong regulations of mediation procedure and doesn't have any requirements to the mediator's profession, which leaves a, lo uh, which leaves a space for working over it, but even though mediation is still practicing by different organizations, volunteers and private mediators. And there are Family Law Modernization Act, the Restorative Justice Act in the field of criminal law, and also the Provincial Court Act and the Court of Queen's Bench Act. Uh, they have a couple substantial mentions. One is that judge in family proceeding may at any stage of the proceeding refer the issue to a designated mediator. And second is about protection, the confidential principle of mediation. But when I am thinking about regulation of mediation, I always come to idea that it should be mediation act. 
I will not hide that this approach I will took from European understanding of the law. Uh, and in my mind, the main purpose of regulation of mediation are in building credibility for this process, clarifying and systematizing it. It is important to have one high quality standard of mediation with explanation of all main principles, stages and goals. When the area isn't well regulated, it could have huge impact on the service quality and reputation of the mediation process in general. And usually, I'm worried about having requirements to the profession of mediation. And as an example, I will use Ukrainian and German experience. Ukrainian law ensures that uh, ensures next requirements to the mediation to the mediator's profession. The basic training of mediators is carried out according to a program with a duration of at least 90 hours of training, including at least 45 hours of practical training. The mediator's basic training program includes theoretical training and practice of practical skills. And according to the law, training of mediators is carried out by subjects of educational activity. Of course, it couldn't guarantee that mediator who obtained this certificate is perfect or at least good mediator. But it will guarantee that the mediator familiar with the main aspects of procedure and has some mediator skills uh, that allow him to get this certificate. And it's better than nothing. In Germany, there are two types of mediators. Certified mediator and mediators who doesn't have certificate. Both could officially practice mediation. But for calling yourself certified mediator, in Germany you need to have at least 120 hours of training, including one case and one-on-one -on -one supervision, it's coaching. On that case, uh, the regulation lists in detail what the 120 hour training must cover and the number of hours required for each section. After qualifying, the mediator requires four documented cases over two years, at least four one-on-one -on -one supervision sessions or four cases uh, on four cases in those two years and 40 hour further training within every four year. So, German, requ uh, German requirements more rigid than Ukrainian, but on the other hand, like German mediators could practice mediation without title certified mediator. But this may affect the demand for such a specialist. The experience of most European countries shows how the law on mediation has contributed to the, to the development of mediation and in general at a certain level of mediation practice, it has become natural to require the existence of law. Although the mediation process as such doesn't need to be strictly regulated and detailed, which may even be harmful to the informal and flexible nature of mediation, there are other purposes for doing it that I listed above as well as to consolidate the practice that has been developed in society at the level of authorities elected to approve the people's will. And let's talk about myths. The first one, mediation is for people who came across a simple conflict and mediation is for people who could talk with each other. Is it true? Do you remember the shuttle mediation? Uh, it is possible to conduct mediation with people who don't want to talk with each other. So this myth is not true. The second myth, mediation is something uh, about talking with mediator like with psychologists. I didn't mention it, but it follows from the context. Uh, mediation is about resolving conflicts and disputes. It's not a treatment and does not aim to solve psychological problems. To be honest, after process, the participants felt to lead and certain transformation in their relations, in their understanding of the conflict. But in any case, this is definitely not a session with psychologists or psychotherapists. So it's not true. 
mediation is meditation. Just no. Uh, uh, without so, uh, court is more effective in resolving conflict situation. I will say yes and no. Uh, it all depends on circumstances and speed of the escalation of the conflict. Sometimes conflict seems to be easy to be resolved, but mediation will not work. For example, when the arguing parties want to punish each other at any cost. Personal dislike, peculiar character traits, circumstances. There are many things that can affect people and we can't convince them that mediation is always better. Sometimes mediation doesn't work and the only possible solution is to feel as you. But at the same time people could think that mediation isn't for their level of, isn't for their level of conflict just because they don't understand how workable mediation is. So it will be 30% <laughs> Next myth. Uh, without lawyers, you can't reach a fair agreement, so it is wasting of time. The question of what is fair is a philosophical question, uh, and what is fair for one may not be fair for another. But mediation is an ideal procedure <laughs> when the parties of the conflict can decide for themselves what is right for them in a given situation. And as you remember, the mediator's task is to control balance power and control the compliance of the agreement with interests and needs of the parties. That is why this is myth, it is not true, and it wouldn't be honest if I will not um, add some small detail, in order to maintain uh, balanced power in mediation process, it is useful for the parties to know their uh, rights and their chance, chances in the courtroom. Therefore, consultation about possibilities to win or to lose in the litigation process can be helpful. And it is always better to clarify the situation. This is not required and parties can skip this recommendation, but even in the process of mediation, legal advice could help in some cases to achieve a better result and maintain power balance. But it's not necessary, so it's not true. And as a summary of this lecture, I would like to make conclusions that there are a lot of aspects in mediation process that are interesting to explore. There is interesting history and different points of view of how mediation came up. There are different points of view of what is mediation and how it should be regulated. You can understand mediation literally as a conflict resolution process or more deeply as a tool for establishing justice. You can agree with something you heard today or disagree and this is the beauty of scientific pluralism and simply diversity of our points of view. I hope that this lecture inspired you to explore mediation and, I, and think deeply about it. Thank you for listening and if you have any questions, go ahead.